Today's podcast is brought to you by my kind sponsors over at JM Bullion, the only place I buy my gold and silver bullion. JM Bullion has been in business for over a decade. They have done over $7 billion in sales. They package discreetly. They have reasonable premiums over spot, and they have great inventory. JM Bullion is my favorite place to buy gold and silver bullion. QTR podcast listeners have their own rep over there. So if you don't feel like navigating the website or if you have questions, maybe you've never bought bullion before, email Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at jmbullion.com. Shoot her an email if you have any questions. Otherwise, just check out jmbullion.com. If you get a chance, tell them the Q-Man sent you. Uh, it would go a long way to helping me continue to feed myself one grain of rice per day. JM Bullion, my absolute favorite in the world of gold and silver bullion. If you're in the market for it, and you should be, because Rome is burning in the background, check out my friends over at JM Bullion. That link is in my podcast description. This podcast also brought to you by my friends over at the Sang Lucci Steam Room. I love Sang Lucci, and I love the Steam Room. Lucci's been my buddy for a decade now. Nobody has been tracking options flow like Lucci and his team. And as many people know, options flow can many times telegraph where the equity markets are going to move. Now so more than ever that zero day till expiration options are a thing. They pretty much drive the swings in the market on a daily basis. Lucci's steam room, they follow that steam in the options market and they trade together as a community. And really, nobody knows trading better, and you're not going to get any more honesty than you will with Lucci. This is a guy that posts his losses while most people are posting their wins. Anytime Lucci loses half a million dollars, he makes sure to make a post about that too, just so you know that he's the real deal and shares not only his gains but his losses. Overall, he's a trustworthy person. I love him. He's a you know, the Steam Room's a great community to trade with if you're an active trader. Lucci also does a live uh, streaming trading show at the Sang Lucci YouTube channel. It's free to watch. I was watching it yesterday. It's pretty funny. Uh, I like Lucci, man. It's a good way to get your setup for the day. If you're a trader, uh, he takes questions. There's pretty much a good dialogue, uh, and that's all free. You can check that out over at the Sang Lucci YouTube channel. Check out the morning live stream and check out the steam room. Tell him you want a free trial and the Q man sent you. He'll make sure you get taken care of. I promise. Lucci, the Steam Room, Wall Street Jesus, the OGs of the options world, and a great community to surround yourself with. Finally, one more community to surround yourself with, my friend George Gammon over at Rebel Capitalist Pro. George Gammon, Chris McIntosh, Lynn Alden, Brent Johnson, you get access to all of these experts and their take on the global financial system. Folks, if you're interested in learning macro and learning how to preserve wealth in a world of out-of-control central banks in a way that I cannot provide with my hour-long podcast full of dick and fart jokes, you need to go over and check out Rebel Capitalist Pro. They have a they do live question and answers almost daily. George Gammon has two great YouTube channels you can check out for free. Rebel Capitalist and George Gammon. Uh, go check him out. Give him a play. But the Rebel Capitalist Pro is worth it. You get access to people like Lynn Alden and their premium research, their mock portfolios. There's an incredible forum over there where people are just constantly tossing around macro ideas. So if you're looking for trading ideas and you're looking to learn the central bank system, do you know what the euro dollar system is? I'm guessing you have no idea. If you don't, go over to George Gammon, go over to Rebel Capitalist, tell them the Q-Man sent you, tell them you want a free trial, tell them you want to check out the service. And uh, any of these people, if you want a deal, you want free shipping, you want a month free, whatever, I'm not guaranteeing they'll give it to you. But if you tell them QTR sent you, they have told me they will work with you. And uh, let's see if they hold true to that promise. So far, I've got no complaints on my end. And I love these people because no matter how many podcasts I do or who I talk to or what I say, nobody gives me shit about anything. So for that reason alone, you should love them. I am not an investment advisor. This is not investment advice. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It's not a solicitation to buy or sell any securities. I hold no licenses or registrations with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And this podcast has a three-drink minimum, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get into it right now with my man, Lawrence Lepard. All right, I've got Larry Lepard with me, manager of the EMA GARP Fund. And the man responsible for 
getting through to my brain a little bit about Bitcoin. Larry, how are you, brother? Long time. I'm no great, talk. man. I'm, it's 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 nice to join you again, Chris. We uh, I feel like you're a brother from another mother because everything you write and I read, and I'm like, I could have written that. I wish I'd written that. <laughs> so it's and, been fun. And every time I read your letter, I think to myself, I don't have the patience to put together all this data or all these charts and all this other. Well, yeah. So, it is it is a lot of crap. Yeah. <laughs> you keep doing what you're doing and I'll keep doing what I'm doing. P perfect. It works. So right before we started talking and, and I want to talk Bitcoin and a couple other things today, right before we started talking, you said you finally figured out why the stock market hasn't crashed over the last two years. And I'm just gonna lay out the scenario and then you can let me know what the issue yep. is because for the last two years I have watched the Fed hike rates from fucking zero to 500 basis points at nosebleed, you know, full on swan dive crashing yep. into the side of the mountain through the windshield pace. Uh, now, if you yep. recall, back in 2016 to 2018, they raised 200 basis points over two years. This time they've raised 500 basis points in like 18 months. And we have seen no effect in the market, and we're seeing some of the lagging indicators in the economy. You know, credit card debt going up, personal savings going down, but the market and the economy have so far held up. And you've figured it out, so let's hear it. Well, I, I have a theory, and it could be wrong, but it's stunning to me, you know, what's happened. To me, it's been the most frustrating piece of the last year or two. I mean, I. I'm just, I was, you know, if you'd asked me at the beginning of this year, will the stock market go back and revisit its old or exceed its old high? I said, there's just no fucking way. And of course I was dead ass wrong. Um, but I found a chart and it's going to be my most recent quarterly, which will be out in a few days. And it's a very interesting chart. It talks about federal government spending. And um, what it shows is that, you know, we were kind of ticking along in the $4 trillion range uh, pre COVID and COVID came along and just blew things out. You know, we went to six, seven trillion in one year. Right. And what's amazing to me is COVID's gone now, right? And yet the spending is still at that level, Chris. I mean, it's we're at 6.1 last year. And and so, you know, it's really kind of this Inflation Reduction Act, of course, which is just a sick joke, and Bidenomics and the fact that the, the debt ceiling won't be revisited until, you know, April of, or I mean, sorry, January of 2025, that has just, you know, they're spending like drunken sailors. And you know, this is this is further evidence. Um, if you look at the December number, it just came out from the uh, CBO, Congressional Budget Office. I mean, the year on year, the deficit in December was up 20 percent, you know. And so for the first quarter, the deficit was 500 plus trillion dollars. And usually the first quarter is one of the better quarters, implying that next year will be over two trillion dollars. Last year, we were one seven. So, you know, I think what's going on is just this all this free money. Um, you know, and, and, and I shouldn't say free money, all this aggressive spending by the federal government. I mean, there's some statistics about how many of these new jobs being created are government jobs or government driven jobs. I mean, there are all these infrastructure programs that are going on. Um, you know, of course, we've got people working double jobs and we've got all the, you know, the growth in, in credit card spending. But apparently, you know, people just seem to be, you know, whistling past the graveyard on the stock market and, and, you know, Maybe it's the beginning of a crack up boom. I mean, people know that the Fed will ultimately have to cave and and go back to free money. Um, and so the stock market's just saying, well, let's let's forget that step where we go down. Um, but I but I don't think they can forget it forever. I think that, you know, there are enough things lurking in the background, you know, that, that there will be margin compression and um, P.E. compression. And at some point, this market is going to roll over. I mean, you don't have a you know, 40 year bull market driven by inflation, which quote unquote popped in December of 2021. You don't have one down year, which was 2022. And then it's all over, you know, it's just, and we go back to normal. I mean, I just, I don't see it. That's obviously what, you know, the, the standard, you know, a lot of people are thinking that that's it, that we'll have the soft landing and that's where we're going to be. But as you point out, when you take rates from zero to five and a quarter, you know, the cost of money, I mean, throughout the economy, it's, it's rippling through everywhere. And, and really the biggest elephant in the room is the sovereign debt crisis. I mean, the fact that the federal government deficit, you know, is leading to higher interest rates and, you know, we've got a trillion dollars in interest expense uh, run rate right now. I mean, I think what we saw, what we just saw is that Powell did something he did not want to do. And, and that is to say he just became Arthur Burns um, because he, you know, in that last, and this is in our quarterly as well, in that last press conference, where he said you've got to start cutting rates before you return all the way to 
that to me was the pivot. And, um, and the market knows it, that he, he cannot keep rates where they are and not have something break. Um, and, you know, we've had things break like Silicon Valley, but I think more things will break if, if they don't start cutting and cutting soon. And in my sense is it's going to be shocking how fast they're going to have to cut this year. So I'll stop there. But that, I think, is yeah. my big so picture view of what's going on, you know. It's an additional $2 trillion Two trillion dollars tacked onto the deficit, essentially. Correct. Yeah, that, that's what's propping up the market. That's right. Right, and so there's going to be consequences for that elsewhere. You know, I maybe a year ago, after a talk that we had where you were kind of explaining what the bull case was for the stock market, and it's a nominal bull case, right? It's not a real bull case. Correct. Right. Right. Which I kind of understood okay a year ago all right so the bull case here is essentially a crack up boom right it's an inflationary right. fucking uh boom it's not real gains in the market um, right but i still can't believe that and every everything that you said makes sense but i still can't believe that we're going to get there without something breaking especially if you look at m2 you know contracting the way that it has uh yeah. and we're kind of i mean it I've been saying this for 18 months for two years, but it, I mean, doesn't it feel like we're at a breaking point anyways, even with the deficit? It, 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 it does, Chris. But I mean, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm somewhat humbled at just how wrong I've been on this whole stock market and how this thing has yeah. kept on going. And I'm, I'm actually almost even beginning to doubt my thesis, which means it'll probably work out. <laughs> the market is close to collapsing, but you know, it's, they've, they've got a lot of levers they can pull. You know, they, I mean, we, we found, we learned all kinds of interesting things. I mean, the Silicon Valley bank thing, they, they created a new facility you know, I don't know if you saw Pam Martin's discovered that, that the Federal Home Loan Board, you know, loaned over it. I mean, that that F, uh, the BTFP um, was like a hundred and some odd. Originally, it was less, but it's roughly a hundred and twenty billion dollars. Well, that's nothing. The FHLB loaned out a trillion dollars in March to the banks. I mean, a <laughs> trillion, right? And that wasn't, you know, that wasn't talked about at all, right. right? I mean, they just they have so many means, and and as you mentioned, the M two is contracting. Correct. Except, did you see recently the Chinese M2 numbers? They're yeah. up like 30%. I mean, it's so, it, you know, once again, all of these governments coordinate to keep their systems going. I mean, China doesn't want us to collapse any more than we want to collapse. And we've got kind of, we've got kind of this mutual, you know, mutual thing going on where, um, you know, we're all, we're all protecting each other from, from a potential collapse. And so, you know, my view is, they may they may string this thing out loud longer. I mean, I'm I'm mentally kind of preparing myself for the possibility that um, that it doesn't happen as fast as we think. I mean, I feel like it should happen now, but to be frank, I felt like it would, it should happen. It should have happened earlier this year, to, or earlier, you know, in 2023. So, um, you know, the 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 tell to me though, the the big um, elephant in the room is the U.S. Treasury market, right? I mean, they've got to sell a lot of debt. Twice, and, twice as much this coming year as the year prior, right? Correct. They're trying to sell correct. twice as much debt this year. Correct. And and all the maturities are getting shorter and shorter. As the T-back came out and said, they're going to lean heavily on the bills market. You know, mm -hmm. so um, you know that means that you know that five percent that those bills are yielding, that's going to be baked in there. And 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 so you know I, what I see them doing, what I believe they're doing is they are setting themselves up to be able to say, you know, we've got a we've got a, a chance here that inflation is coming down and we want to get ahead of it. And so we're going to start cutting these rates. And of course if they cut the short term rate, then those bills will be cheaper because, you know, the, the risk arb guys and the basis trade guys will, will bring that whole market down. And so their interest costs will come down. That's what they have to do. Um, and, and they're going to do it. And, you know, my sense is the other thing that's, you know, the wild card in all of this is, is an election year, right? right? So, you know, we know with, with high probability that they are going to do whatever they can to hold this whole thing together. And, and, you know, I, I think that that's a certainty, you know, the, the, um, what the stock market does, who knows, but I think it's safe to say that there will be more monetary debasement. Do you know what I mean? That's, to me, that's the end of the game, the end, you know, the end point, because, you know, with all the debt that they've run up, they cannot continue to carry it without growing the money supply. They just can't. We're already starting so, to see it a little bit with the jobs numbers, you know, and the revisions in the jobs numbers. You know, every time we get a jobs number, <clears throat> you can tell that the prior number has been uh, 
goofed, yeah. goofed up is, a little bit. Like, is, it, is it like nine out of 11 of the prior reports have been revised downwards? It, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so, and, you know, if you don't think that they're doing the same exact thing, trying to squeeze as much juice as possible from the CPI lemon right now, then you're Correct. sorely mistaken, which means on a day like today, when we get a CPI number that exceeds expectations, it's – you know how bad is it really behind the scenes? Well, not only it's probably it's it's probably worse. Although there's a guy on Twitter called the Happy Hawaiian who I suggest people go take a look at his account. It's just the Happy Hawaiian is his, his handle. He did a really nice piece today where he shows how the future inflation expectations CPI will come down largely because um, 30, roughly 35 percent, maybe a touch more, is in uh, housing and rents. Right. And that area is actually softer. You know, the the, the seven percent mortgage rates, eight percent mortgage rates. You know, the, the the enormous increases that we saw in in housing and rents that's stopped. And so, you know, and it takes a while for that to filter through because there's a lag. So, you know, my sense. I mean, even Jeff Gunlock said it recently in a podcast, which I that was very good, where he said, you know, there's a chance we're going to get a one percent inflation print or one and a half or two percent inflation print. You know, there's a chance that we get a negative inflation print. I don't think it lasts very long right. because to me what, what happens next, I mean, Tavi Costa has got a great chart that I retweeted today that shows, you know, the three waves of inflation. And we're, you know, we're obviously coming off. We went as high as 9%. We're back down into the mid threes. You know, who knows how low we go on this round. Maybe we're at the bottom. Maybe we go down to one. Maybe we go negative. I doubt we go negative. But, but the point is that, you know, what will then eventually what will happen is the monetary accommodation will start again. The dollar will continue to slide. And to me, that's another piece that f people haven't really focused on. Go look at the chart of the dollar and how much, you know, it's suffered in the past, you know, since since the, they started pivoting and in indicating that they were going to not raise rates more and, in fact, cut rates. Because what that tells you is, you know, a lower dollar is going to push up oil prices because oil is, you know, the largest commodity in the world. And as a result of that, that's where your next round of inflation will come. <coughs> Excuse me, but it could be, it could be, you know, three, six months out. But, you know, these guys are always behind the curve. Always. I mean, they, they, they pushed it too hard. They broke it. They're breaking it. <laughs> and they're using <laughs> indicators that are all lagging. Well, that's the thing. In nature, and that's you why know what I mean? I, I, somebody made the analogy. It may have even been you on that podcast I told you I was listening to. Somebody made the analogy of they're doing 100 miles, doing 100 miles an hour forward looking out the fucking back window. <laughs> well, that's ex that's exactly right. I mean, you know, that. They basically have, um, yeah, they, they, and I mean, to Powell's credit, in the December 13 conference, he did say, I mean, the Yahoo Finance woman asked him a smart question. So, well, when, how do you view this rate cut stuff? Are you going to wait until we see 2% print on, you know, PCE? And he said, no, you got to cut before then, you know, because there's a lag effect. So, right. <coughs> excuse me, that's the first time I've ever heard him right. really kind of, you stop it, it makes, it makes you think. Yeah, it makes you think that, you know, hey, maybe this guy's starting to get the hang of it. You know, he realizes he's gone too far, and so he's got to start cutting now. But, um, you know, it, look, they're jokers. We don't know what they're going to do. They, you know, they've lied in the past. I mean, they kind of consistently get it wrong. But my sense is, you know, if you read some of the good stuff on Zero Hedge and, you know, some of the Lori Logan stuff, who, you know, she appears to be the woman inside the Fed who has the best understanding of the monetary plumbing. And there's a great article on her on Zero Hedge recently, which talked about all the different strains that they're seeing in the bond markets. And, you know, my sense is that they're serious. I mean, the odds of another cut, I mean, they may talk it, they may job on it a little bit, but the odds of, I mean, the odds of another raise, they're like zero. And they are now definitely going to be in a cutting mode. Oh, yeah. And it's just, it's just a matter of how fast. And my sense is it might start off slow because they might want to try and avoid, you know, he might want to avoid being called Arthur Burns. But you know, and I know, that as soon as these layoffs start, as soon as the problems start to get larger, they're going to cut, you know, just very, very quickly. And the thing that my partner and I are watching so carefully that we think is really important, you know, we're, we're about to start kind of earnings reports, you know, for Q4. And we'll, people will give outlooks for Q1 and Q2. And our sense is you're going to start to hear some bad news. Um, you know, that, that the lag between the time when you raise and and the time when it really starts to hit everybody, it's that lag's just about over. And, um, you know, I mean, witness, you know, I mean, people are hurt and witness the growth in the credit card balances. I mean, oh my God, it's astronomical. Made, did you just right, see, did went, you just see the consumer credit numbers this week? Yeah, I saw them. I mean, it's just, it's just going straight up. 
And so what that tells me is that, you know, people are kind of at the end of the rope financially and they're, you know, they're borrowing to maintain their lifestyle. And, you know, you can do that for a little while, but the average credit card, you know, interest rate has gone from, you know, teens into the high 20s and, you know, eventually the credit you numbers you were like quadruple expectations this week, weren't they? Correct. Correct. And, and the other thing I find interesting, I mean, have you noticed, and it's just a small thing, but anecdotal, but have you noticed how a lot of these big organizations are starting to let you buy things on time, you know, like buy your groceries on time oh, or yeah. buy Walmart stuff on time. Well, what's that about? That's about a guy whose credit card is maxed out. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, well, that's so, where all these fucking plankton of the lending world like you know afterpay and fucking all these companies klarna you know right. they, they want you exactly. to finance a pack of gum you know and yeah. advertise I mean, it over it's, 36 it's months I mean, at 30 yeah, percent. it's insane and this is yeah, like you want to i mean pay over time for your groceries i mean what's that all about right I mean, this is, you know, we're talking it's about some nightmare really... nightmare is what it is. Yeah. It's a nightmare. We're talking about a really a really strung out consumer when you got to start to pay for your groceries over time. You well, know, pay over time was always designed for, you know, long-lived assets like cars, right. you know, but um, yeah. But anyway, so it, look, it's, you know, it's a confusing time um, and, you know, I, I've kind of given up, you know, I've lost my crystal ball. I, I, I just don't know when it's going to change. I really don't. And that means it's probably about to blow up. But one of the but things, I, one no. of the things that I wrote about towards the end of last year that I wish I had seen a year and a half ago, but I didn't. Yeah. And so, like you, I'm just eating. I'm eating crow, and that's fine. That's right. You know, pretty much what I'm doing most days. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but one of the things I wish I had noticed was that it's when the rate cuts start that the market really starts to crash and recessions start to take hold. At least throughout the course of history, it's been yes. the time when the Fed has stepped in and started to cut, which essentially is like where we're heading to now. That's the uh, chasm that we're crossing now, right? Everybody's talking about soft landing, and they did it, even though the num even though the inflation numbers are higher than people expect, even though the economy, you know, there's all these ugly lagging indicators. The Fed is about to declare victory and about yes. to start cutting, and I'm wondering if that's going to be the impetus for all hell it's, to break loose because then, it, yeah, then it's, that's it's, a fucking worst case psychological scenario if the fed is cutting and the market is crashing and there's nothing that they can do well that's exactly right and as i i remember you know 2001 like it was yesterday and i remember 2008 and 9 like it was yesterday and yeah i mean when when you know what again it's it's the looking in the rearview mirror right they've over tightened they've caused the damage you know, now that damage has got to run through. And, and yes, okay, we're going to start cutting, fine, but that doesn't solve anything. You've already caused the damage. You know, you lit the fire. And, you know, the fire is going to get worse and worse. And, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to go back to ZERP. I mean, Logan in her Zero Hedge, you know, comments was saying that there's a good possibility that they'll, they'll, they'll reduce the QT. And, you know, I, I think people are going to be shocked by how quick we go in the other direction once it oh, really yeah. gets rolling. Well, because it's not, it's not going to be orderly. They think it's going to be, Correct. okay, we're going to, we'll engineer a couple of 25 basis point cuts. We'll get things down to three and a quarter percent. And that's where we're going to sit for the next five years, the neutral rate of interest. And that's just not going to happen e either before they start cutting in March or, right. or shortly thereafter, something will break somewhere. And Correct. as they do, they will overreact to the downside uh, with rates. This is just speculation. But, I mean, they, yep. th this is how they operate, right? Something happens as a consequence of something that happened two years ago, and they overreact. It's like when I ate mushrooms for the first time, okay? I <laughs> ate a couple. I ate a couple, and I waited around for, like, five or ten minutes, and I said, you know what? These fucking things don't work, you know? <laughs> Somebody sold me shitty mushrooms, right? So I wander around the fucking Wissahickon Park for a little while, and I'm thinking to myself, well, I might as well eat the rest of them because these aren't going <laughs> to kick in. And then I eat the rest of the mushrooms. And then all of a sudden, I go to the gas station, I buy a bag of chips, and I walk home thinking to myself, what a fucking waste of $100 or whatever I paid for these. And I get home, and I get into my pajamas, and I sit on the couch with my bag of Cheetos, and I turn on the television, and all of a sudden, 
all hell breaks loose because <laughs> the mushrooms were not defective, as I found out. They just take an hour to kick in, right? And so that's how you learn the hard way, something called low and slow when it comes to drugs, which means if you're going to experiment with drugs, start with a low dose and take them slowly and wait for them to kick in. It's the same kind of thing. You know, the Fed has just eaten all these mushrooms and they're just walking around going, these fucking drugs don't work. Somebody sold me fucking defective mushrooms. <laughs> and little do they know, as soon as they get home and flip on that television, the fucking picture is going to drip onto the ground like paint falling off of a fucking wall. And these guys are going to be on Neptune before they know it. And that's I think, when we're going to see I, a decisive move lower in rates and then, you know, you'll see stuff like Bitcoin and gold just fucking go through the roof. That's what I think. I think that's right. I mean, I, I think that's my scenario, but too. But, you know, to be frank, I, like I say, I've been very humbled by what's happened and how long it's taken. So I, I can't even I can't even guarantee that it's going to happen in that fashion that quickly. But but I'm pretty sure we're going to trend in that direction because, you know, the laws of economics have not been repealed. Um, and, uh, you know, the the. Um, you know, the, the problem they've got with the growing debt and the underlying money supply not growing as quickly, uh, that's that's just not solvable absent, you know, more money supply growth. It's and nice so, to be modest, but how else are they going to fix the debt spiral that we're in? Well, that's I mean, my point. Literally. They can't. Even that's if they, my point. Even they, if they manufacture they can't. some kind of jubilee, right, and everybody, yeah. you know, holds their breath and decides to delete one decimal place from their Excel spreadsheet all at the same time at central banks across the world – Right? right. Even if that happens, how are other assets? How will assets respond to that? I don't know. Yeah. No. It's. I mean. Yeah. That's right. I mean, uh, sound money assets are going to go through the moon, and um, you know, if it, yeah, it, it's w what we don't know, Chris, is we just don't know the timing, and we don't know the path. That's all. I mean, you know. I mean, you know, there are there are time periods, there are lags on all of this, and there are time periods that. You know, we're, we're right about the, the thesis, but we just don't know. I mean, this could happen next month and it could happen in a year. And so, you know, I've just I've learned to kind of temper my enthusiasm for how fast it's going to happen. I mean, um, which, you know, probably means it'll happen next month. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm totally mentally prepared that they can, you know, they can drag it out a good bit longer because they're pretty good at can kicking. I mean, um, what are they going to do? I mean, are, are gold miners going to go to a P.E. of one? No, is that no, what, no, no. Is that no, what's going to no, happen? I, because if that happens, no. I'm fine with that. You know what I mean? I yeah. buy gold oh, I miners too. on a recurring basis, just like yeah, you no. buy your Bitcoin, just like I just buy my Bitcoin now. I got my uh, thing set up. We'll talk about that. But uh, I'm okay with that, you know? But, like, what, I am too. what's, what's going to happen? I mean, gold miners, to me, if you want to buy a, a – if you need to buy – equities that spit off mm -hmm. cash and are undervalued mm -hmm. i i just i challenge you to the only fucking companies out there that are close to gold miners in terms of valuation are probably like legacy automakers and airlines which have no no room for growth there's no room for you know leverage they they're consistent they, they kind of like spit off cash okay maybe you got like utilities Maybe you could kind of throw in there too, but it just in terms of asymmetric upside and then the ability to spit off cash and you're only paying for, you know, seven, eight years worth of earnings and you pretty much, I mean, there's no guarantees. You pretty much have a guarantee that gold's going to continue to go up over the course of the long term, in my opinion and in your opinion. Can you, can yep. you name another sector that no, not looks even like close. a deeper I mean, value than gold miners right now or silver Not miners? even close. I mean, you know the the Brazilian equities are pretty cheap, um, and there's some you know there's some specific areas that are cheap. I mean, I'd say oil and gas are still on the cheaper side, in my opinion, of, of where they will you know where they will ultimately trade, um, because I think we'll, we'll I think we're going to higher energy prices. And this, you know, the the big part big picture theme that I I'm working under is the notion that deflation ended in March of 2020, right. and we now live in we now live in an inflationary world, and so you know, it's going to, it's going to wax and wane. It went to 9%. It's now back at three and change. Um, you know, it, who knows how low it'll go, but then there'll be another wave because, um, because of the way the system is constructed. And so, you know, we know that we're on the right side of this trade, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, as you say, you know, I mean, I've got companies in my portfolio that are trading at three times cash flow, two times cash flow. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, uh, when I get new money in, I buy them. Uh, <laughs> 
you know, and I'm, I'm very highly confident that when, you know, gold takes out this $2,100 high, which is kind of knocking on the door right now, it's been for a long time over 2000 Well, it's certainly than, not doing what you would expect gold to do in, an, in a hawkish environment, is it? Where it's parked, well, that's right. parked no, at that's all-time exactly highs right. with rates at 5% while the Fed is supposedly fighting inflation? Well, that's exactly right. In fact, there's, um, Luke Roman published it recently, but there, there's a fabulous chart that shows you know, gold versus real interest rates. And they, they really, you know, inverted and they really track together. I mean, you know, when, when real interest rates are high, I mean, that's how Volcker put it all back in the can back in 1980. He took the real rate up to an enormous number by going to 20% interest rates, you know, that, that controlled the price of gold. And, and they track, you know, very much the same and have for 40 years. And, and, but recently, I mean, as in like in the last year, they've started that, that correlation has broken. And the reason I would submit that the reason that it has broken is that, you know, gold sees around the corner right. and and knows that in spite of the fact that the, you know, federal you know, central bank has taken interest rates up to five and a quarter percent, that that cannot and will not last. And so, um, you know, gold is just kind of biding time um, in the range. I mean, it, it was a, it was roughly at 2000 on the peak of the inflation in you know 2020. Um, and it hasn't broken through that because inflation has come from nine to three. But, you know, in, in a normal environment, looking back over the last 30, 40 years, normal environment, you know, gold would have gone from 2000 down to 1400 and it did trade down a little bit, a couple of times. I think it hit a low of 1682, but yeah. you know, it's basically, it's bit. basically, yeah, it's basically been in the kind of 18, 19 and now really knocking on the door of 2000. And so I think as it becomes clear that the fed has to cut and will cut, and as it becomes clear that the economy is rolling over, and as, as the stock market finally starts to break, and I can't say that it's doing that now, but it feels like it might be, then you know my sense is that these sound money assets are gonna are gonna do extremely well. And you know while we're talking about that one, I mean let's move to the next one, which is Bitcoin. I mean, you know I mean gold was up I don't know t- roughly I think 10% last year, maybe a tad less, um, but you know Bitcoin was up 150% last year, so. You know, if you, I consider these to be kind of, you know, the two most logical, neutral, sound money, you know, assets out there. Um, you know, one is digital, one's analog. And, uh, you know, in a, in a climate where that should have been very hostile to both of them, you know, one of them did expect, spectacularly well, you know, um, Bitcoin up 150 odd percent, and the other one did reasonably well, up, you know, up 10 percent. So um, to me, um, you know, it, it, those things are telling us that something's different here. And, um, you know, you've got even, you, you know, and it's in the mainstream now. I mean, you see it in the journalists talking about it. You see the FT talking about it. You see big money managers talking about it. I mean, people are coming to understand that we have a fiscal, you know, uh, fiscal problem in the United States. And there's, there's, there appears to be no resolve to, to solve it. And arguably, you know, they're going the other way. Somebody on Twitter recently said there's been talk in D.C. about another tax cut, which is just stunning to me. I mean, we're, we're running these huge deficits and they're talking about another tax cut. <coughs> so I, I've often said the only thing that could mess up our, our thesis is responsibility in Washington. Right. And, which, right. Which, which yeah, we right. Often I mean, laugh at, you know. Yeah, which we all laugh at. I mean, look, it's not impossible. There's nothing in this world that's impossible, you know, but, but it, it certainly, from what we read and see, it certainly wouldn't appear to be highly likely today. So, um, you know, and, and with an election coming up, I think it's only likely to, to get worse. So, um, you know, my, my view is, is we are well positioned. And I do know that, that, you know, I mean, we all tend to trend follow. Once gold takes out 2100 with authority, it's not going to stop at 22. You know, it's, it's going to go to 3000. And so we're waiting for this next big wave to start. But when it does, it's not going to be a, a small matter. And, and furthermore, when it does, the stocks, the gold stocks are going to really catch up. I mean, a lot of my investors say to me, why are we doing so poorly or why are, why are our gold stocks trading so poorly? And it's a simple answer. If you go to Bloomberg and you look at the consensus estimates for the price of gold five years out, people are still saying 1750 1800 right. And the, the ASIC, the average cost of pulling an ounce out of the ground, has been creeping up steadily because of the underlying inflation and the explosives and the oil and gas and the labor and all and so forth. And so we're up to ASICs now, you know, maybe 1200, 1250 on an industry average basis. And, you know, you're selling it at 2000. That's a nice margin. But if you, 
if you believe that we're going from 2000 to 1715, you believe that the ASIC is going from 1250 to call it 14, 15, 16, well, you can easily in your mind get to a, a model where, hey, we're only going to make a 10% profit margin on these things we're, we're mining. And, of course, that would make these a shitty business. But, um, you know, my personal belief is that gold is not going to 1750, not in this kind of fiscal climate. There's no way. And so uh, it doesn't you know, seem like there's an easy way to make that case. Uh, the only way I could see it going to 1750 is at the trough of a major deleveraging during correct. an economic event, which would be an area where I would want to uh, be get aggressively long because exactly. it would precede huge central bank intervention. And, and exactly. you're talking about maybe you'd have a week. To, to get that trade on because yeah or maybe or maybe or maybe a month i mean i remember 2008 i had a friend who was running a gold fund and yeah he got killed you know when, when the gfc hit, hit and you know and correlations all went to one i mean his fund his gold stock fund went down like 50 percent you know in three weeks okay and you know he was frankly ready to jump up the window and i can't blame him um you know and gold had gone from 800 down to 600 these are round numbers i don't have the exact numbers but you know, very, very quickly, because once again, when you, you know, when one of these crises happens, everything gets sold, right? right. Correlational one. But, but 60 days later, he had made up that 50, that 50 percent down. And, you know, six months later, he was up 100 percent. Right. So the same, you know, same exact thing happened in March of 2020. Exactly. You know, same, same story. I mean, everybody March of 2020, decided the world was ending due to COVID. The trade right. was sell fucking everything that isn't bolted down. It doesn't matter if it's Correct. a gold miner or, you know, doesn't matter if it's liquid, anything. hit the yeah. fucking sell button. Right. And then and then, of course, the Fed, seeing that there's no bid for their government bonds and the whole financial market is imploding, does what they're always going to do, which is OK. You know, I mean, he, he imitated Mario Draghi. He said, you know, whatever it takes. Right. You know, and, and just I mean, we're going to we're going to have stimulus. We're going to send out stimmy checks. We're going to borrow the money. You know, we're going to we're going to open swap lines. I mean, trillions and trillions of dollars, you know, thrown into the system. And of course, you know, the natural response then was, oh, my God. And, you know, I mean, in 2019, my fund went up 80, 98 percent. And in 2020, my fund went up 122 percent. So, and you they, know, and they're going to do it. There's no other option. They won't let it crash. And I, I don't think the, so. I mean, I, well, yeah, you know, it, it might crash, but it's not going to be for the not want of them not trying. You know? Well, that's correct. I mean, that, yes. I mean, as, as Bernanke said in his helicopter speech, you know, deflation preventing it here, we can always do that. I mean, you know, they, they have this tool. And, and I think that's what the world doesn't focus on is the fundamental flaw of Keynesianism and the fundamental flaw of a system that's built on debt and how, you know, this is the same crisis. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. And, you know, start it. Yeah, right. And it started at dot coms and then it went to housing and now it's at the sovereign debt level. And it's not like some man from Mars can come down and solve the problem. I mean, there is no higher level than the sovereign debt and the sovereign currency. And so, OK, fine. You want to keep your system running? You can keep it running. You can print whatever money is necessary to make every liquid, everyone liquid. I mean, like UBI in Canada, you can send people checks. You can do everything necessary to keep it running. But guess what? You know, there's, there's no way that's not massively inflationary. As we yeah. just and saw with the COVID example. What's right? super gnarly is the sovereign debt level is where all the fucking rot is, right? So Larry right. Lapard can't fucking overdraw his checking account. He Larry Lapard can't not make his electric bill and expect things to still go fine. Larry Lapard can't not pay his mortgage and expect to still keep his house. Larry Lapard's town of fucking Boston, Massachusetts, or wherever you live, they can't default on their fucking obligations or their payments or whatever. But somehow when you get up to the, you know, or Larry Lapard's business, you know, if you can't yeah. pay your fucking, uh, if you can't pay your administrator and you can't pay your auditor, you know, that's it. You lose your LPs, it's game over. There's no, there's no, so, but all of a sudden when we get to the sovereign debt level, there's this magic, Right. All the laws right. that apply to you personally, your small businesses, your township, your municipality, your state, they all get thrown out of the window when you go to the sovereign debt level. And that means that's where they have been sweeping all this shit under the rug. And so if the crisis right. is a sovereign debt crisis, it's a little bit bigger of a problem than, oh, the you know, some of the regional banks are fucked or the housing crisis is taking a haircut that we don't like. Right. No, that's exactly the housing right. Market, I'm sorry. That's exactly right. And. And we know, because they've done it every single time we've seen it, we know what their playbook is. So, um, you know, the, again, Chris, back to, the, back to the original premise. We know, we know with high certainty what's going to happen 
the difficulty is we don't know exactly when it's going to happen. Right. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, if you have a time preference that's more than six months or a year, which I do, I mean, I have kind of a five or a 10 year view on all my investments. You know, I'd much rather take something that I'm pretty sure is going to happen in the next five years, even if it causes me short term pain or it doesn't give me instant success, because I'm really highly confident that's going to happen. Whereas, you know, am I really highly confident that NVIDIA is going to continue to change the world with AI and, you know, continue growing at the rate it's growing? No, I'm not. You know, I, I think that, you know, that, that that thing could be topping out and it doesn't represent a good investment at these kind of valuation levels, right? Um, whereas, you know, there's nowhere to go but up in these gold stocks, nowhere, you know. And um, and honestly, I think there's, you know, very, very asymmetric upside in silver, gold, and Bitcoin as well. I mean, just because they're, they're forms of money that the government can't print, you know, and... I mean, real estate's another, you know, asset that has that characteristic. The negative on real estate, of course, is the tax piece and, and the fact that it's hard to move around. You know, and it's not, I mean, it's not hard to move around. You can't move it around. So, um, and if, you know, if your town or municipality decides they're going to tax it, well, so be it. You're going to pay the tax. So um, it's, it's a very, it's, it's, it's a sad thing. It's, it's very difficult. I mean, I think, I think more and more people are becoming aware of the issue, Um you know, because the 60-40 thing has stumbled. It's stumbled hard. But but it's amazing to me the muscle memory that the investing public has. And I think it's because, you know, if, basically if you got in the stock market since 2008, you've never really seen a serious bear market. Ever. Ever. I mean, I've been investing since the early 80s. You know, I went through 87, went through the 90, 91. Even, I mean, even March 2020 was short-lived. It was, it was yeah. a month and a half and then it was over. Right. And so, you know, so you've been you've been highly trained. Anyone who's been in this market since 2008, which represents probably a decent you know, portion of the people who are managing money today. Right. It has been has been highly trained and incentivized to just buy the dip. Yeah. You know, that's 16 it, it all, years. That's it, 16 years. So, if you, right. you know, if you were I mean, graduating I, college in 2008, you're 36 years old now. Or yeah, 37 so, years old. Yeah. And, and so. And even even to a certain degree, you know, going back to 2003 or something, I mean, if you started there, you, you've done right. fine, too. I mean, you obviously took a hickey in 08. But but the point is that, you know, as I as I talk to people who are potential investors and they're just kind of like, well, my financial advisor says I've got to be in stocks. And, you know, yeah, they go down, but they always come back. And if you're not there, you're you know, you're you're a loser. He's, he's and, 29. Um, you know, he's 29 years old. The people that right, lived through the, the, the 70s and the people that lived through, I don't know, correct. you know, the, the, the correct. 20s are, uh, are dead or retired. That's right. And so, you know, nobody, most of the investors alive today have not seen a serious inflationary environment. And, you know, we are setting up for a very serious inflationary environment. I mean, you know, we've got the we've got the sovereign debt troubles of the 20s when a lot of companies went off, countries went off the gold standard and reset their currencies and either had hyperinflation in Germany or, you know, in the U.S. we reset in the 30s. Um, you know, we've got the, the kind of the debt burden that, you know, occurred in World War II. And then we've got the inflationary pressures of the 70s. And so, you know, the, the combo of those three is very, very hostile to bonds, extremely hostile to bonds. And and somewhat hostile to equities, you know, being kind of, you know, which equities are we talking about, right? I mean, it's, you know, in the 70s, by the way, I mean, gold and silver and or gold and silver miners and oil and gas producers were the two best performing categories in the 70s. And they each compounded at 30, the indices, each compounded at 30 plus percent annually for 10 years. So, you know, it's, it's not as if in an inflationary environment, you can't make money in stocks, right. but you've got to be in the right ones. Right. You know, you've got to be in the ones that are going to be, you know, well positioned to take advantage of the inflation. So, but anyway, um, you want to move over to Bitcoin? Cause yeah, I know, I, I know, I, I, I know I've kind of orange, I know I've kind of orange pilled you a little bit yeah, and I'm, 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 you can have a clip here to, uh, to send out to your, uh, yeah. Well, no, and, and once once you get a taste of it, you start to realize that hey, you know what? This is this isn't such a bad thing. I well, mean, it's it's I'm it's kind of working, right? I'm trying to understand it. I really am, yeah. it, and I'm trying to wrap my head around it. You yeah. know, and and this started in December of 2022. So it's been no, it's been almost a full year now that I've really tried to be open minded about Bitcoin in a way that I haven't. You know, the last two days I listened to Michael Saylor's interview with Lex Friedman from 2022, which is actually, it's a, I mean, he, 
he definitely has a comprehensive understanding of things for certain. He sure does. He's and, a smart uh, guy. He is a very smart guy. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I, I want to try to simplify it, I guess, as best I can. But mm-hmm. and and you really helped with this that one interview you did where you were comparing it to the internet. I don't know. Something just clicked. But really, the the value is in the protocol. It's yes. A, the and, mm-hmm. and that's very difficult for people to understand because it's mm-hmm. digital. And so they, yeah. unless you have an understanding of exactly how it works, it's really hard to say, oh, okay, there's something different there. You know, yeah. to, to most people, it just looks like you say money's a ledger, right? So you got X amount on your bank account. You don't hold that money. You log into yeah. your bank account. You see you got $5,000, whatever, but it's a number on a screen and it's all digital, you know? The the Mm. bank has lent out your money a long time ago and probably has already lost it. (laughs) One of the miracles of fractional reserve banking. But um, I think the understanding that the notion, as you called it in one of the podcasts I was listening, I just listened to another one you just did today while I was running. Mm. I think uh, it must have been from this month. But the notion of discovering the idea of digital scarcity, mm-hmm. that that the idea of digital scarcity is is what's new. Yes, that, that, that's that, the invention. Right, it's the invention that previously hadn't been there before. Correct. And when you, when you mash that together with the fact that it has kind of the first mover adoption, and now with the, you know, the ETFs, I mean, I, I just... You don't even have to understand it to know that that kind of feels like an inflection point because as I yes. think you were saying there's RIAs have 20 trillion dollars of assets out there and so More, if they allocate yeah. they allocate 5% of those 20 trillion dollars in assets to bitcoin where they wouldn't otherwise have been able to you know and bitcoin has a market cap of 700 billion dollars x out the the coins that are in cold storage that are never going to be moved and that have been lost that you know mm. that represents obviously enormous asymmetric upside even now even as far along on the adoption curve as we are idiots Correct. like me that are just starting to understand that now you know there's still if if you're right and the bitcoin bulls are right and it does stand the test of time the upside is going to be extraordinarily asymmetric from here without mm. without a doubt if you guys are right um for me it was wrapping my head around the idea that the protocol is where the value comes from. And and it's yeah. so hard for me to fucking get past the fact that there's nothing tangible backing it. Right. But, right. but really, it's, it's what the protocol affords you the ability to do. It's what the decentralized nature of and, and the redundancy of the protocol affords you the ability to do is kind of where it harnesses its value. And all of that shit is digital, which makes it extremely difficult to wrap your head around if you're a fucking lunkhead like I am that likes to, you know, take gold and fucking smash it against the desk to make sure that it still, you know, is a tangible product that I own. And so right. am I am I getting close to describing this? Can you unpack no, it a little right. bit that's more? That's exactly right. I mean, and it's, it's funny, Chris, there's an interesting analog here. You I don't think you were probably investing in this time, but I recall buying Microsoft when it came public in 1984. Okay, and and I was I was we were I was in a venture capital business at a big venture capital company, you know, not big, medium size, and um, I recall very clearly thinking, boy, this software is really powerful stuff. You know, it runs on these PCs, and you know, Lotus One Two Three had just come out with a spreadsheet, which morphed into Excel and so forth, and and um, you know, a lot of us young folks were kind of like, man, software is going to be a big deal. You know, because these, these machines are machines, and of course, everyone, every, and everyone was investing in the machines, and everyone knew what the machine business was, but nobody was really that big on the software business. A lot of people were like, "Well, how can software have value? I mean, right. it's just a bunch of lines of right. code. Do, right. do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's just a bunch of lines of code that can't intrinsically have value." And I was like, and, and, and those of us who were younger, and, and I had a little bit of computer science in college, and so I said, "Well, no, it does have value because." You know, if it's proprietary and everybody's running the same one, and you kind of alluded to this with the Bitcoin, I mean, they created digital scarcity. Now, others could have created digital scarcity too, but 
what you got going on here is you've got a, you've got the network effect where Bitcoin has kind of become Google, right. and you know the, the, there's so many people using it that nobody's going to use anything else, right? I mean, what are the odds that we have another Google? I think they're low. I think Google's well, in a you know not over, not impossible. Over time, over time, there may be competition. You know what I mean? There, Apple that's true. rose from that's the true. dead. Apple rose from the dead to take on Microsoft true. over the course of forty years, true. Or thirty years. True. After true. They beefed although, in the although early Apple, 90s. yeah, although those are two, those are both hardware businesses, not networking. But businesses. I'm just making the point that and, just and, because and one wrote, company's up top, like that, doesn't mean that eventually over well, the course well, of time Apple, they can't Apple, be dethroned. Al- Apple also rose from the dead by creating a network. You know, by creating an ecosystem where that's exactly you know, right. You know, you had an iPod and you had a phone. And everything wanted to talk to each other, blah blah blah. But you know, and you had you had an app store and so on. But but look at but a company anyway. like Adobe that makes its money yeah. off of you know CAD, right? AutoCAD. Right. Right. Yeah. No, that's right. I mean, it, so so the so the bottom line is, yeah. I mean, by by creating digital scarcity and by developing this protocol, um, they they really, you know, in my view, they really have changed the world. And um, it, you know, and it's just, it. it I mean, people are going to fight it. But um, as long as as long as the use cases are growing, and as long as more and more people are adopting it and using it, and you know, as long as the core developers don't in some way screw it up, I mean, it's interesting. I was in a meeting, small meeting with with Michael Saylor, and and we asked him. We said, "Hey, you know, Michael, what concerns you about this thing?" Right? And, and he was quite honest. He said, "The only thing I get concerned about is if you know, if we somehow got a rogue group of the core developers." Who all kind of decided, ah, you know, we need we need to change this, or we need to change that. And he said, but I look at the core developer group. I know who most of them are, and I realize how diverse they are, and I realize how smart they are, and I realize how they understand what the value proposition is. That you know, while maybe one of them could go rogue, you know, there's no way. I mean, it would, you know, and and, and by the way, even if a few of them went rogue, you know, all the nodes would have to agree to run it and, and everything else. But but I think the the only thing that concerned him would be some kind of a you know, a core development, um, you know, misstep. Um, in, in particular, he alluded to the notion of the block size wars. You know, I mean, part of what makes it work is that you can run all these nodes and that you can have the block sizes that you have. And we fought this war, you know, four or five years ago where there were those who said, well, you know, we're never going to get enough transactions on, on one block. And so we got to increase the block size. Well, if you do that, suddenly all the economics of mining change and network change, I mean, everything right. changes. And so anyway, long story short, what he said is, you know, the only thing that would concern him would be a large quorum of the core developers deciding, you know, getting their ego in the way and deciding they had to make it better or take it in the wrong direction. And as, you, it, as you said on the, that podcast that I was listening to, the, the more adoption it takes on, the less risk there is because the, I think the more the risk kind of gets spread out and the more redundancy there is. I think that's exactly right. And, and a layer two is coming along with lightning and, you know, people are going to be able to, you know, self custody much more easily. I mean, we're still, you know, I was involved in investing in the internet in 92 and three and four. And I mean, we're still at kind of the, you know, AOL dial up days. I mean, in this stuff, we really are. I mean, it's clunky, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, you know, you you want to self custody, you want to get a cold card or a treasure, you want to, you know, air gap your, you know, your coins. I mean, it's a nightmare. Yeah. It, I mean, even to the relatively technically sophisticated, it's not a no brainer. Do no, you know what I mean? Not. And to, and to your, to your grandmother, it's, it's just completely beyond the pale. I mean, there's just no way they're ever going to go there. So, you know, we got to make this totally idiot proof and, and, you know, to the credit of all the people who are investing in the companies in the space, they all understand that. I mean, there's a, there's a company that ego death has done called Fediment, which is really going to, in my view, change the self custody issue in a big, big way. Um, and you know, they're, they're about to launch. And so, you know, you're going to see innovation that's just going to make it more common, more easy, more regular. And, you know, I mean, they're, they're, and they're businesses that are really threatened. I mean, think about it. You know, these lightning guys are talking about make, making transactions, you know, 30 bips or less. Okay. Well, you know how the whole credit card industry works, right? What are they making? 300 bips? I mean, you know, MasterCard, Visa, all these guys are just raking these huge fees off of every dollar spent through their credit cards. Yeah. And this will this will all eventually go through the Lightning Network, you know, at one-tenth the cost. You know, and, and you might think, well, that's, you know, that's not a big deal. But it actually is a really big deal because, you know, I mean, apart from the rewards back, I mean, if, if, if suddenly, you know, you were telling either a, a business or a consumer, hey, you know, 3% of your money is going to come back to you because, you know, we, we have a more efficient system. You know, and you say, well, gee, I spent X thousand dollars last year, 3% of that's why. Huh, yeah, I'll do that. That's meaningful. So, 
Um, you know, there's, there's just a, there's a lot of good things going on with it, and it really is going to change, in my opinion. It already has, but it will continue well, to change the world. And it'll back, be back it'll to be point, subject about, to regulation, you know. Now with the yeah. and, and I've, I said even years ago, I think regulation might be the biggest validation yet because it doesn't change the underlying, right? It doesn't change, you know, the decentralized nature of it. It doesn't change right. its portability. It doesn't change its fungibility. Uh, it doesn't change those properties of it. It's just uh, yeah. a layer of regulation on top of that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it, that that's correct. But, but it's actually fairly regulation resistant and going to get more so. Oh, yeah, it's so, like a slippery fish you can't even hold on to. It, 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 of, really, it really is. Uh, yeah, it really is. And, and to be frank, I mean, that's partly, in my opinion, why they approve these ETFs. I mean, they had to. Yeah. Yeah, well, and they, they had to, and they, they, you know, at least in that system, they know they're going to get paid the taxes, right? Right. I mean, you know, the the, you know, it it is rather extraordinarily simple to avoid the taxes if you're, you know, self self uh, custody, um, and and they know that, and so you know, they want to get everybody to be in the ETF game, and that's fine. I mean, look, when I sell mine, I'm going to pay my taxes, but but they're very much aware of the possibility that you could skip, you know, you could skip that step. And so, you know, that's why they, they decided they'd rather have it in-house than out-of-house. And that's why I think they approved the ETFs. But it's, you know, look, it, you know, you said something early about how we're not that early. And, and I think, I mean, this would be like, you know, a sailor who says, compare it to Manhattan real estate. I mean, okay, so if you were the Dutch in 1640 and you bought real estate, it seemed pretty cheap. And then, you know, in, in 1700s, it, you know, they, they looked at what the Dutch paid and they bought the same stuff. And it was probably 10x what the Dutch paid. And then... Right. You know, in 1840, it was probably again 10x what the you know what the what the English paid in the 1700s. Do you know what I mean? And then, I mean, it's just it's kind of like, um, you know, I mean, I get jealous of people who are buying Max Kaiser and these guys are buying them at two dollars a coin. I bought my first one at 300 bucks, you know, and and there are people looking at say, well, I just can't pay this much for it. Well, you know, if you knew it was going to be a million or four million or nine million, I mean, you know, would you? Would, I mean, would forty thousand, forty-eight thousand really still sound it's high? Not, to you? And it's not even about what you're paying for it; it's about what the value of the U.S. dollar is going to be against it in the future. Well, that's that. That's the other thing. I mean, you know, and and of course, you know, part of part of what, in my opinion, part of what will happen here at some point is we really will have extremely high dollar inflation. And yes, Bitcoin may be a hundred thousand a coin or even a million a coin. Sadly, though. You know, gasoline is going to be twenty five dollars a gallon, right? Exactly. You know, or, or or fifty or a hundred. I mean, because there's just going to be there's going to be so much debasement in order to keep the system running. I mean, you know, the what's going on in the United States is interesting because it's happening here with a big reserve currency that's historically been pretty well managed and pretty stable. But 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 in turn, the, all the characteristics that are happening here, we've seen this in emerging countries. You know, we've seen this in Argentina. We've seen this in Venezuela. We saw it in Weimar. I mean, well, Weimar wasn't an emerging country. It was a, a big country that lost a war and had debt reparations. But, but the point is, you know, we've, we've seen this in Turkey today. You know, I mean, when governments get behind and they print money to cover the expenditures and cover their costs and cover their interest, inflation gets really, really, really high. And when inflation gets to be, you know, we're lucky that the last round, it only went up to nine. I mean, I, my sense is the next round, it could easily go to 15. And, you know, you know what 15% inflation does, Chris? I mean, it, you know, it wipes out your Pulls savings. Pulls forward a lot of demand, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, it does, but it also it also wipes out half your savings in three years. Yep. Do you know what I mean? I mean, and, 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 and by the way, then... You know, then it gets even bigger, and then of course, at some point, Gresham's law kicks in, and everybody's doing what the you know the Germans in Weimar did, which is, the minute they get paid, they're converting their stuff into something that's real because they know that the prices will be higher the next day, and of course, at that point in time, the currency's doomed, you know, and it it, it becomes Zimbabwe or Venezuela where you know you can use it to light a fire, but nothing else. So, but but I mean, we're obviously a long ways away from that in the United States, but but the point is that the trend towards higher inflation, in my opinion, unless we see an enormous policy reversal in Washington, D.C., the trend towards, you know, much higher inflation is very, very well developed. And, it's, just, it's just not going to happen because you know. it's political suicide, as uh, James Lavish would say. It's, yeah. uh, it's political suicide, and it would guarantee a, a collapse in the economy. I mean, th and that's it. You said it, too, on this last podcast I was listening. There, there's, two, there's two directions here, man. The fork in the road – one side leads to crushing depressionary deflation and a complete economic collapse, and the other one leads to 
more inflation and it's going to be the latter not just because it's the easy way out and everybody's a pussy but also because it's the easiest way to kind of do it behind the scenes without people noticing you know because well, people, it, people don't understand inflation they don't understand how it works they don't understand why it happens they don't understand why it's quote unquote necessary they even the fed doesn't get it they don't know what the neutral rate is they don't know why their target's two percent nobody really understands it so it kind of happens in the machinery of the night eating away at people's I, purchasing power and i think that's what makes it super nefarious go ahead no i think that's exactly right i mean it's you know when you present any politician with the you know, um, you're facing immediate collapse now. You know, the ATMs aren't going to work. The financial right. system's going to blow up. Everyone's going to lose their job. You know, General Motors is going to fail. And and by the way, we test ran this. This is what happened in 2008. You know, you, that's how you get Hank Paulson on his knees begging, you know, Nancy Pelosi to pass the $700 trillion tarp bill. You know, and the first time through, the, the, the Congress had gotten so many letters of complaints billion. from people. Yeah, so, I'm sorry, $700 billion. Yeah. That, that they they rejected it. Of course, when they rejected it, the stock market went down twenty five percent one you know one day or one week or whatever. And then of course the next time through it passed with flying colors because the politicians are very much aware that that, that longer term inflationary consequences are less bad for them than immediate financial collapse. Right. I mean, and that's that's really that's really the mental calculus that takes place. Um, now. There is one. There is a third possibility, and I just don't see any statesman-like people that are thinking about it. But you alluded to it earlier in our conversation, which is an intelligent view of the financial system and a and a one-time reset. And you know, if we had some leadership that understood the debt problem that we had, that understood the financial system that we had, you know, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they could theoretically work out a system whereby they. You know, they did a one-time reset. I mean, Roosevelt did it, you know, in 33. I mean, he, he reset the price of gold in order to try and stop deflation. And to a degree, he did. Uh, it took time. But, there, but would be, there would be consequences to that elsewhere. Of course there would. There would be winners and losers. But, but I mean, the, one, the other thing, I mean, you know, and I've, I've been criticized on Twitter, and it really bothered me, you know, for being a doom monger, because I'm not a doom monger. I'm just a financial analyst. But, um, you know, the... the um, the fact of the matter is that, you know, these these bad things are coming, in my view, and and so one has to prepare for them. And and oh, I, the point I guess I was going to make is that if we did do a reset, no matter how much pain we went through in the doing of it, when you return to a sound money standard, and I've I've read about all the hyperinflations and so on and so forth, and when what you find is that they're devastating obviously to people with wealth to the you know to the social structure the whole the whole nine yards it's bad but usually when they're over the people are smart enough to go you know what we're not doing that again right and they either they either return to gold or they, they grab some other country's currency like you know argentina they ran they run on the dollar or they you know they find some stronger currency that's trustworthy and they run on that and things recover fast i mean people People want to go to work and they want to get paid fairly and they want to add value. And, you know, if, if we don't get into some kind of stupid shooting war where, you know, somebody, there's a nuclear exchange, and a lot of people die, you know, we still got all the people, we got all the productivity, we got all the computers, we got all the technology, we got all that shit. What's broken is the monetary system. And so, as, you know, as scary as all this sounds, and, you know, people say, well, you're, you're being a doom monitor. No, I'm not. I'm just saying you got a broken system. You've got to, you've got to basically change it and go back to a sound money system. I mean, that's what's broken. And, you know, what's, what's most disappointing, I'm sure you would agree with this, in, in the political system in the United States is that, you know, it's like one in ten people that understand that that's the issue. I mean, you got, you know, blue, blue hates red and red hates blue and this guy's an idiot and that guy's an idiot. And, and I agree. I think they're all idiots. But you know, and both parties have, because, both parties have no problem running huge deficits. Exactly, exactly. And my point is, you know, they're, they're all idiots because they're not really focusing on what is the core Fucking issue. Fucking cowards. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's no, true. I mean, and and if if we were, I mean, there's some guys like Thomas Macy, and you know, I mean, there there's some people who have small pieces of the puzzle. You know, right. it's Judy Judy Shelton who was nominated for the Fed. She understands it. Even She's Marianne Williamson even too has actually made yes. some very yes. cogent statements about quantitative yes. easing and how it is as you, as I think you said, welfare for the rich, right? Exactly. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. And so. So there, there are people who kind of get pieces of the problem, but they're very much out of the mainstream. They're very much lonely voices, and so, sadly, you know, um, you know, it's 
know, what is it? You know, Americans do the right thing after they try everything else. Churchill said, I mean, that's, you know, sadly, we're going to they're, they're going to drive this thing right off the cliff and, and people are going to go, what the hell happened? We've said you know, that. Come- we've said that, too. The government has to exhaust all incorrect options for Correct. everyone until they have tried all of the wrong options. They will Correct. not arrive at the realization that the right thing right. to do is the, is the right. way out. And by then, it'll and just the, be the charred wreckage of everything. Exactly. And, and it'll, there'll have been some serious pain, sadly, for a lot of people. But but I think everybody at that point in time will say, you know what? This really was stupid. You know, Keynes is wrong. This whole experiment was stupid. Getting off the gold standard in 71 was stupid. And, you know, we've got to return to a sound money it's standard. It's only been and, 50 years. You know, it's yeah. only been 50 years we're walking around with our, with our fucking wangs out like we just solved the greatest problem in economic history, you know, telling the whole world right. to go fuck off and economic laws don't matter and we've got the system here that's going to, you know, fix everything and lead us down the road to utopia. We figured it out. All these fuck right. faces at Harvard that have been plagiarizing one guy since like 1890 in their entire compendium of work is one person regurgitating the other person's bullshit for 120 years. They have all devised a system here that is going to allow everything to remain perfect at all times, flying in the face of all natural economic laws. That's where we've arrived at. It's only been 50 years, Larry. It took us 50 years to get from going off the gold standard to really approaching the event horizon of the black hole of the economy, which is where we're at right now. 50 years. That's, about, that's, that's nothing. That's about right. That's nothing. No, it's, no, you're right. That is nothing. And, and it's it's interesting because there have been studies that have shown that, you know, the average fiat currency lasts something around 40 or 50 years. So we've kind of hit, you know, our, our natural, you know, natural lifespan. And, and look, I mean, it, we, you know, the U.S. was a responsible country. We won World War II. You know, we, we, we set the whole thing up in the way that we did. And, you know, we did a lot of things right. But, you know, sadly you know, for, for want of a nail, you know, the horse lost the shoe. And I mean, it's just like, it, it, you know, you, we got on a slippery slope <laughs> and, and as a result of the slippery slope, you know, as you say, I, we are, we are coming at some kind of an event horizon. And there are those who say it could last another 10 or 20 years. I don't think so. I mean, I, I will, I will, you know, I'm, I've been wrong in being. Maybe it does, but it won't last another hundred. No, I, I, no. I, and not 10 or 20. I mean, I think, we're in it right now. I mean, the pace is accelerating. The size of the swings is accelerating. The size of the bailouts is accelerating. I mean, just the debt's accelerating. I mean, and, and you know, I don't think the average human being understands compounding or exponential functions. They don't, you know? because and, if they did, they'd be shitting themselves looking at a chart exactly. of our interest expense. Exactly. That's right. And so, so with that, with that kind of as a as a backdrop, you know, I my my belief is that this is all over and wrapped up by the early 2030s. You know, and that's look, that's six years away, so it's it's not tomorrow. But um, you know, I think we've got a few more kicks of the can, a few more swings. But but with each with each swing, more and more people will become aware of the problem, and and those who take steps to protect themselves in terms of the way they maintain their savings, will you know will benefit at, at the expense of those who don't. I mean. You know, I, I knew a lot of people who had laddered bond portfolios that, you know, kind of got pretty badly hurt in, you know, 2022. And, um, you know, they're kind of looking at inflation and saying, wow, that, that didn't, you know, that's no good. Um, the thing that's shouldn't even sadder, been, though, is... Shouldn't have been chasing yeah. that succulent five basis point yield on that bond that you were looking for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, they, they say that, that's no good. But, when, but the amazing thing, Chris, is that, you know, there's, and there's a big group of those people who still think we're going back there because if you look at the five by five inflation swap, you know, it's like two, eight, five. So yeah. there's a, you know, there's a large part of the world that kind of thinks COVID was a blip and it's over and we're going to go back to a deflationary world with low inflation. And, you know, I, I just don't see that. I don't, I don't think that's the likely outcome of what's happened here. I think, you know, when we had, you know, I don't know, 15 trillion of negative yielding European bonds. And, the, you know, the 10 year was yielding 54 basis points in, in 2020 in March of 2020. I think that was it. Well, that was peak deflation. That was a blow off. And, um, you know, now we're in an inflationary world. And so, you know, goes to nine, goes to three, goes to t- 15, goes to 10. You know, it's, it's we're, we're going the other direction. And, you know, my view is when you've got a big macro trend like that, if you're in it early, 
you're going to benefit vis-a-vis other people. And I think people are going to be shocked at, you know, the price of gasoline, you know, the price of gold, the price of Bitcoin, all of these things. I think that, you know, these will be the, the, you know, the areas where people need to absolutely protect themselves. And so, you know, in talking to potential investors in my fund, what I always say is, I always try to understand what their total asset picture looks like. And then I say, how much of that are you using to defend yourself against the inflation that we think is really highly likely? And if the answer is zero, in my view, I I scream at them. That's a huge mistake because, you know, there's some possibility and I think it's very high, but they can argue with me on that. And that's fine. But there is some possibility that we are in a very inflationary world. And if that's the case and you don't have assets designed to, to perform well with inflation, then, you know, you're going to lose, you're going to lose purchasing power. And, you know, that, that's just, that's a bad thing. You don't, you know, you work all your life to get the savings and the assets you have, you know, you don't want to see them shrink in, in value as you age, you know. And COVID so. may have been a blip, as you said, but the consequences of ramping the money supply 40% year over year was not a blip. That was correct. That was one of those spots on the train tracks where they shift the tracks in the other direction and your train takes off on a completely different course that's, than it was that's heading absolutely. to prior because we were we were on a deflationary track and all of a sudden that just shifted us to an inflationary track so you know covid that's, will be long gone and we'll still be suffering the consequences of the policy that, that's changes that, we made. that's absolutely correct and you know and, and i mean and there's there are other things to support that the underinvestment in capex in stuff you know, it, it was, we had a great run for financial assets. Financial assets did incredibly well from 1980 to 2020, you know, right. 2020. And, um, you know, and, and it, in the same period of time, commodities in general didn't do very well. And, uh, and so, you know, no money in commodities. You know, we didn't increase commodity production. We didn't invest in commodities. Well, you know, uh, my sense is that that's going to catch up with us. And those those financial assets aren't going to hold as much value, and those commodities are going to become more expensive. And you know, it's just as simple as that that people will start to shift their their capital. You know, I mean, you know, you can buy Nvidia with an earnings yield of what you know less than one percent, or you can buy you know one of the good gold miners that I hold with an earnings yield of thirty five percent. I mean, pick one. And Dude, and hedge I'm... against and hedge against like the top twelve potential risks that the entire well, world correct. and the global economic system face. Well, that's all correct. I mean, that's that's thirty five percent today, you know. And and you know, if 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 we have this kind of inflation that I'm describing, you know, gold is gold is historically incredibly cheap relative to the money supply outstanding. I mean, I've said this in other calls and podcasts that. You know, in, in 1971, if you took the base of money outstanding divided by the 261 million ounces that the U.S. theoretically holds, and I say theoretically because I'm not sure we do, um, you, you came up close to the $35 reference price that they set at Bretton Woods in 1944. But if you do that same math today, the price of gold now has to be $86,000 an ounce, and it's at 2000 So, I mean, that's a, that's a full backing of the monetary base um, with the gold that the U.S. owns. Um, it, you know, it's, it, look, it's kind of a bullshit number, but the, but the point is it just gives you a sense of how much paper money we've created versus the ounces of gold that we hold. Right. Do, do you know what I mean? And, and um, you know, the, the paper money created has just been extreme. And, um, you know, if, if, some, if some group of the people out there decide that, you know, I, I don't want to hold this paper money anymore, I want something that's scarce, well, then they're going to go buy gold and or they're going to go buy Bitcoin. And I mean, you know, my view and, and to you, I don't know what your weighting is on it. But once you get involved, you start to learn more about it. Once you learn more about it, you become more and more convicted. And, you know, I'm at the stage right now where I'm half gold, half Bitcoin. Yeah, and, I'm not you know, there. I'm, I'm mostly gold, but I'm more Bitcoin now than I've ever been. And, there you go. And I think there you that go. Uh, like you like you said on your podcast, you know, you allocate. Um, according to risk. And uh, right. yeah, I, w- I do want some of the call option there. And I do think there's some good stuff there. And I do see the monetary world the way that you do. Um, yep. It's it's the largest allocation, I, I think, as a percentage of my portfolio it's ever been. Um, and, great. Uh, no, that's great. Well, and by the way, it'll grow naturally. Because look at whatever percent it is right now and double yeah, when it. When it outpaces we're, we're... everything, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I didn't start at 50% weighting. I mean, I, I was buying it at five and 10,000 and it went up, you know, 
forex. So, right. you know what I mean? But and that'll happen to you too. I mean, I you know I personally I think we we'll see Bitcoin one hundred thousand this year, you know, and, and two hundred in the fall. It's tough to make a case where it where it doesn't just coming off it, of the back. Really, even even if it doesn't make it in ten years, it's tough to make a case where this year. I just don't you know I I think it's difficult. It doesn't. It could be fucking tofu. Uh, it's just tough to make a case that it wouldn't go up this year, given I think the tailwind that it's going to see, not only from the ETF adoption and all of the new cash that's going to pour into it from that, and then, of course, the FOMO that comes with that, but also with the cuts. And if you think the chaos and the fucking QE is going to come this year, right. too, that'll be a tailwind also. I think that's right. You've got, you got two different ways to win. you got you got one way to win is that you have this enormous body of people. And I said in that other podcast, I think that RIA is like 20 million, 20 trillion. It, actually, I read another article that said RIA might be 100 trillion. I don't know. It's hard to know how much RIA money there is. But there's, there is a big bucket of money out there in the United States that are managed by people that if a client came to them and said, maybe we should own some Bitcoin, they literally couldn't buy it because the RIA – couldn't self custody it. They couldn't get a treasure. They they weren't going to buy. It. They weren't going to open a Swan account, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They're just sitting there on their own, saying, well, "I'm sorry, we can't buy it." And they looked at GBT and they said, "Ah, it sells at a discount. The fees two percent. We're not going to buy that for you either." Right. Um, but but now, you know, they're they're all sitting there and they're saying, "Look, this thing's got a lower sharp, you know, better sharp ratio than anything else out there. Higher sharp ratio, I'd say. And you know, it's one of the best performing assets in the last fifteen years." Last year it was up 150 percent. You know, I'm, I have had several friends come to me and say, "God damn, I, I'm so pissed I didn't buy it at 15,000." You know, I, I thought the FTX thing was, you know, the end of crypto and the end of Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And I said, "Yeah, no, I understand that, but you know, I told you at the time, it's not the same thing." They're, it's they're tough. An apple you got to strip an away. Yeah, you got to strip away the. Fraud. They were an you apple and an orange. Away, I mean, right? The exchanges. You got to strip away the third parties. Yeah. You got to strip away the shit yeah, coins. You got to, you know, all that shit. All that, and it made it—it it made it very tough. Look, it's—it's—it's it's, it's always very tough. I mean, I, you know, it was very tough, you know, buying Amazon when it had, you know, three or four fifty percent drawdowns, and yet Bill Miller hang, hung in there with it. I mean, right. I remember—I remember owning Microsoft, and at times, you know, Microsoft would have a stumble, and people were like, "Well, maybe this thing isn't the thing we thought it was." But boy, if you stuck with it, you know, it just—it became one of the, you know, the monster stocks in the world. I mean, it was just kind of stunning what happened, and. And I honestly think this is the same kind of an opportunity. I mean, you know, there are 8 billion people on the planet. There are 21 million of these things, you know. And and so, you know, we are so early, Chris. I mean, you know, owning a whole coin is going to be an enormous deal. Doing an on-chain transaction is going to be an enormous deal. It's going to get to the point where it's going to cost thousands of dollars to do an on-chain transaction. But you won't need to because you'll be doing lightning things. You'll have a Fediment wallet, you know. But, but the point is that... You know, I mean, there are one of the 45 million millionaires in the world. Not not even every millionaire in the world can't even own one Bitcoin. Yeah, so, you know, if you if you yeah, right. I mean, they can only have half. I mean, so if you own if, if you own if one it goes whole to bit- zero, that doesn't matter. But if it makes it, that's fucking sick. Yeah. Right. Well, think about it, though. I mean, if you own one whole Bitcoin, basically the price of a nice car, you know, 48 grand right now. If you own one whole Bitcoin, I mean, almost by definition, you are a millionaire. Because, you know, what's going to happen is all these other people are going to decide they need to own some of this stuff. And and the price is going to go up. And it's not just going to go up a little. It's going to go up as, as sales. It's going to go up forever, Laura. I mean, it's just not – it's not going to stop going up. It's like Manhattan real estate. There's a scarce amount of it. And it's got monetary properties that nothing else has. And, and more and more people are coming to see the value of it. So, you know, I'm quite comfortable that my coins will one day be worth a million bucks a coin. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah. So, well, let's, you know, it, let's just say this after that last, yep. because now I feel like the gate's swinging too far in the other direction. Let's just, no, let's, know, just know, remind, let's just it's remind, let's just remind the listeners. But, let's remind yeah. the listeners. Okay. That we're pretty much yeah. just fluffing each other here, which is fine because we're in that minority you talked about. We see the financial system in a different way that other people do. Correct. And that there is, there is a high likelihood that we're wrong and we've been wrong many times before in the past. Absolutely. Right? All right. Good. Just get that well, out there and, for and, legal and, and purposes. Furthermore, and, and furthermore, let me let me make another point. Mr. That if you own s- one coin, you're already a millionaire. <laughs> God, my no, I, butthole I, puckers I up when I hear statements like that. No, I think that's true, though. I'll tell you, though. I'll tell you, though. The, well, I would, it's just I would, not. 
it's not. That's the problem. So you know. Well, well, it, it, but I think it will be ultimately. Then that's a different. It, that's a different statement altogether. I, I agree with you. I agree with you, Chris. <laughs> Look, here's 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 the here's the point. Here's the point. We do know from pattern recognition that it has had severe drawdowns, and so I think everybody looking at owning it and buying it has to understand that they have to understand what it is. They have to understand why they're buying it. Right. And they have to be mentally prepared for, in my view today, probably the max drawdown is 50%. But in the past, you've had bigger ones than that. Right. And so you, you have to be mentally prepared that you, if you bought it for $48,000 today, that it could go to $24,000 well, or $2,200. you have to be prepared for it to just not work out. That's well, what and, you have and there, to be prepared for. Well, there's that too. There, there's that There's that too. I mean, I think the odds of that are quite low, but but that's. I, that, I you agree know, with you, but that doesn't mean that yeah. I haven't made peace with that. No, no, and that doesn't mean we haven't been wrong in the past. But my right. point is, anyone buying it, I think, needs to understand, you know, the issue regarding the volatility, and and that's why, from a sound money point of view, you know, and I have a lot of clients who are older, you know, they don't want something that can go down fifty percent. They just right. don't, and and gold has never had a fifty percent down year, never, ever. I mean, a big down year for gold is like twenty percent, and that's rare, very rare. And, you know, in general, on average, gold's gone up 8% a year. Now, you know, that's a lot less than Bitcoin's gone up per year. But, you know, it's a lot less volatility as well. So, right. you know, so, so you know, what I say to people who are looking for sound money alternatives is, you know, look at your risk appetite and look at the volatility that you think you can withstand. And, you know, for your, your safe, you know, gold's, gold's your long-term bond that you know will hold its value. And that, you know, it's immutable and it's, it's not going anywhere. And, you know, Bitcoin is a racehorse that could really, really outperform and could grow. And, and the reason that they're both going to take advantage of monetary debasement, the difference between the two is that Bitcoin is on a big adoption curve. Right. Gold's been around 5,000 years. Eight billion people know what a gold coin is. Right now, if you really think about it, I mean, you and I talking about this and people on listening to this on Twitter and other places who are sophisticated and looking at this, you know, compared to the average person in the United States, we're rare. I mean, we're still, this is still a subgroup of the larger investment category. And um, as a result of that, you know, it's, it's going to take time. You know, these things take time to roll out. But we do know that every year the use cases grow. We do know that every year the number of addresses grow. We know that every year the hash power grows. And we know that every year the applications making it easier to use and supporting it are increasing. So in, in all of those respects, it reminds me very much of the internet. And as I say, when I invest in the internet, I remember very clearly, you know, I remember Krugman's statement that it was no more useful than a fax machine. I remember people saying, well, why would anybody really care about that? Right. And I was kind of like, what? You can't see the value of this thing? You know, and, and, and they said, wow, it's really hard to use. You got to put your phone in a modem. You got to plug, you know, before, especially before the browser came out when you were dealing with green screen. You know, it's like, yeah, it's kind of a toy. It's just a techie game toy. And yeah, okay, so you can send a message to somebody, you know, whatever. I mean, it just, it didn't seem like a big deal at the time to a lot of people. And of course, look at what the internet is today. So, um, you know, it, it, it has that feel to me. And, and that's part of what gives me and the like, comfort. Like you said that, on that, that podcast, there's there's a big difference between the adoption of 1980 in Internet relay, relay services to, you know, 15 years into Internet adoption, which was kind of where we are with Bitcoin, which would put us around 1998 to 2000. And just think that's about where, where I think we are. Think about yeah, where we I, were then, which is Netscape Navigator and, uh, you know, basically like using the HTML blink tag to where we are yep. now, which is, uh, you know, your toaster has internet, which is, you know, right. a very, very yeah. different spot. Yeah, they're very, very different spots. And so, you know, so you got to give it some time. I mean, we got to, we need, we need a lot better apps. We need a lot more support. We need a lot more ubiquity. But those things are all coming. I can see it. We invest in these companies. I know a lot of people who are doing this stuff. And you can see it's all in process. And I think that, you know, people are going to be really kind of surprised at, at how, how, you know, how quick it starts to kind of unfold. And, um, you know, it, and so it's going to become a question of, you know, when did you get in? And, you know, I mean, you know, it'll get to the point. I mean, if a coin's 100,000 or 400,000, I mean, it's, you know, it's going to be a lot harder for the average person to buy one coin when they cost 400,000 a pot, you know, but right now you can buy one coin for 48,000. And so to me, you know, if you've got investable assets and that's not a crazy number for you, that is less than, say, 10 percent of what you're investing. You know, that's that's probably a good hedge against all the monetary chaos that, that we're 
that you and I see and that we think we're living through. Do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean, and I want to thank you very much. I know we've gone over our time quite a bit here, but uh, thanks for taking the podcast on short notice. I was dying to talk to you after listening to these last two podcasts. Oh, thanks, Chris. I, you know, I always enjoy talking to you because I, I feel like we're on the same page in terms of what's going on. And God, someday we're going to be right about something really breaking. And I don't know if it's, <laughs> Some, I don't know if it's tomorrow. we're going to be right about something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, a blind pig finds something. Okay. I mean, I don't know if it's tomorrow or I don't know if it's a month from now, but when when the next March 2020 happens, and it will happen sometime in the next, you know, year, year and a half. I mean, you know, I'm going to make it a point to give you a call and say, hey, you know what? We weren't so fucking crazy. We were right. See? You know? Because... Yeah, well, you will you, you'll be on the podcast for sure. You're, you're a regular <laughs> okay. now. I enjoy talking okay. to you. And, yeah, likewise. Uh, you know, like I said, I try to keep an open mind, too, on the things that I don't. I don't want it to be an echo chamber, which is why, you know, with the Bitcoin thing, I you know, I really do have for me i don't know if it was just stubbornness or if it was just inability to wrap my head around the concept of what's happening but the the more i kind of educate myself about it the it's like mental health it, it, it's yeah. it's similar analog for me you know mental health was a thing that i always just kind of thought didn't exist because it was <laughs> well seriously like when i was in my 20s i was like who needs that pussy shit you know like i didn't go to going to therapy like what the hell's wrong with you and then you start to like you start to understand, okay, like this is a thing that's in my head. All right. This is how I'm thinking about things. It's not something I can't, I can't hold it. I can't fucking like, I, I can't grip it physically and like move it from one place to the other. It has to do with my understanding of things and it has to do with Correct. my, the, you know, the order in which my thought process goes on. So, and Bitcoin is, it's similar in the sense that it's digital. It so you, you can't hold it and move it from one place to the other. It's, it's a concept and you have to fucking be able to wrap your head around it in a little bit of a different way. And so, you know, it is, it's, 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 it's tough. It's tough to understand. And uh, and it takes time to understand it, and you have to read about it and learn about it. I don't, I don't know if you've had a chance to pick up Seyfedean's book, you know, the Bitcoin Standard. But if I had, you know, one book I would recommend to anybody who's in, is curious and wants to get kind of the, the most the best overview of it, in my opinion, that's the book to buy, the Bitcoin Standard. I mean, it it's an easy read. It's good Austrian economics. It explains. And he was a gold bug, by the way, before Bitcoin. Yeah. And it ex explains why Austrian economics matters. And then it explains why gold, and then it explains why you know Bitcoin is is, is a digital you know digital version. And, and that's that's and, a whole other episode too between me and you is talking about how Bitcoin has shoehorned Austrian economics into the minds of a younger generation well, that wouldn't that normally great? be paying attention to what central banks are yeah. doing. Yeah, and, and that's and that's fabulous, right? It really and that's, is. That's fabulous. Yeah, it's gonna and these people are gonna demand change, and we need it, as you know. So, so. all right, Larry, thanks uh, so thanks, much, Chris. Man. Really enjoyed it. Yep, we'll uh, talk anytime. soon. Anytime, give me a shout. Okay. Oh, oh, I cut him off there at the end. Hopefully he wasn't saying something important there at the end. Oh, and by the way, I've got the uh, secret formula for making a trillion dollars in five seconds. That was his last sentence. I owe you guys another two seconds of Larry Lapard, but I don't think that was what it was. It's was probably just him coughing some more. I hope whatever is ailing him, uh, <laughs> I hope whatever's ailing him uh, stops ailing him. Listen, thank you so much for listening. I have a couple, of, I'm going to have this dude James Lavish on. I'm talking to him right now. Been meaning to have him on for a while. He'll probably be my next podcast. Um, but if you want some listening to do in the interim before my next one drops, check out Larry Lapard and James Lavish talking together. It's on one of the Bitcoin podcasts. It's available on Apple uh, Podcasts. I listened to it yesterday. Really informative. It's not all about Bitcoin at all. A lot of it's about the, uh, the debt spiral that the government is in right now. So good reading. Folks, try not to miss me too much. I'll be back at some point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fools, I'm out of here. Peace.